Well, good morning. If you have your Bibles, turn to Acts chapter 8. I know it's warm in here, and we have some hand fans as y'all come in, and then we actually have some fans up front. So as Baptists, I know you Baptists like to stay all the way in the back, so this is, we're enticing you to come up front. The front folk get fans, okay? So just letting y'all know. Get here early, get up front. Uh, well, guys, welcome. So glad to have you. If you are a first-time guest, we want to say a special thank you. Uh, in your ministry guide is a connection card. Fill that out, place it in uh, the offering, or better yet, take it to the welcome table. We will trade you that connection card for a free gift uh, just for saying thank you for visiting us today. Uh, one big announcement next week is uh, Beach Baptism, 5 o'clock. Uh, we would, if you could meet here at like 4.30, if you want to um, convoy over there, because some of y'all, you know, I, I don't know, raise your hand if you have one of the park passes, the Charleston County Park Pass. You know, yes, yeah, so all the parents are like, yes, you know, we have, uh, but some of y'all, if you don't have one of those park passes, you're like, $20, I mean, I want to support, you know, baptism, but for 20 bucks for half an hour, uh, I tried to see if they just let us in, and they won't, but uh, if you, if we want to come together, meet together, and then if you have a parking pass, we could just bring some people with us uh, in that way. So, 5 o'clock next Sunday at Beachwalker Park, Kiowa, we have two candidates so far, uh, and uh, if you have followed Jesus, uh, you've made a decision uh, to invite Jesus into your heart, and you've surrendered your life to Jesus, and you've not followed up with believer's baptism, please come see me, and um, we would uh, love to talk to you about that. So, here's the thing about me. I hate spiders. I mean, I mean, I hate them. But Sean, everything is created by God, not spiders. No, I mean, they, they're, you know, it's like Beelzebub said, boom, they're spiders. I mean, I hate them. There is a deep loathing. If there's a spider on my arm and a machete in this hand, boom, the arm's gone, okay? I mean, it's bad. Uh, when I was younger, I found a spider, a big honking spider on my porch. And right next to the big honking spider was one of those big web egg things. Now, don't judge me. The judgment's coming in a minute, okay? So I killed the spider like a righteous man of God that I am. And then I saw, and I know you're feeling bad, but they're baby spiders. I did not care because baby spiders grow up to be horrible adult spiders. So I went to stomp what I thought, see, I was not good in science, and I didn't realize I thought an egg had a spider in it. Some of you who grew up in the country know what this is about to be. I hit that thing. A zillion baby spiders came running all out. I mean, guys, I'm telling you, it was like I screamed like a baby girl. I think I cried. It was horrible. I went to stomp out that spider. Instead, it led to thousands of baby spiders all over the place. I'm pretty sure that's when I decided to move out of that apartment. And so that, that's just kind of how it was. A similar thing happened to the church some uh, 2,000 years ago. A similar thing happened. You see, there was a guy, Saul, and he thought he was going to step on the church and stomp it out. And instead, thousands went out from, uh, went out from there and began the movement of Jesus Christ. And so uh, that's what we're going to unpack today in Acts chapter 8. Let's pray. Lord, thank you so much for this day. We love you, and we are just so grateful to be into this, in this house, worshiping together and studying together. And I pray, God, that a word would not come from my lips that is not first anointed from you. God, I pray that you would open the eyes of our hearts that we may see you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. And that just shows you the redemption of God in my heart that I just compared the church of Jesus Christ to spiders, okay? So um, that it, 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 it's a constant work. So in, um, in the book of Acts, chapter 8, we're going to be starting in verse, uh, verse 1. Uh, just a little recap, if you weren't here last week, we were in 7, and, uh, and we had, um, uh, you know, one of the, the young deacons of the early church, Stephen. He was a young up-and-comer. He was a man of God, and he was out preaching boldly. He was arrested for preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ, and has, he was arrested con confronting uh, the, the Pharisees and religious leaders, I mean, he just preached at them and he uh, proclaimed boldly and actually told them that they had hardened hearts, you stiff-necked people. And because of that, 
uh, the, the religious leaders took him outside the city gates and they stoned him and killed him, the first martyr of the church. And so as the, as the chapter ended, it said they laid the garments at the feet of Saul, okay? So uh, thus entering this new character into this narrative of the early church, Saul. And so that takes us to verse 1 of chapter 8. Here we go. And Saul approved of his execution. And there arose on that day a great persecution against the church in Jerusalem. And they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. Devout men buried Stephen and made great lamentation over him. But Saul was ravaging the church and entering house after house. He dragged off men and women and committed them to prison. And so in this first section of this, uh, this passage, we see after the death of Stephen, Saul was emboldened. You see that Saul maybe didn't have anything directly to do with the stoning of Stephen, but as you see that he was there and they laid the garments at Saul, and this martyr, martyrdom of Stephen emboldened Saul. And so he's like, you know what? That's good. Let's keep this going. And so it kept him going, and, and, and it says that the deacons scattered it says, but the apostles stayed. It's important that there needed to be a stability in the home church in Jerusalem. There needed to be stability in Jerusalem. As the, uh, the, the, they needed to see, the, the Pharisees, the religious people, needed to see that the church had not been broken. That, that, that rock had to stay strong. And so the apostles stayed, but the deacons spread out. It says that there were devout men who buried Stephen and made great lamentation. They, they wept, they mourned Stephen. I say there, when you look at devout men, you could, you could uh, replace that with courageous men because as, as Saul and, and, and people are going door to door, uh, attacking and persecuting and imprisoning these Christians, you have these devout men willing to publicly not only bury Stephen, but to lament and to cry and to mourn him. If the persecution began with Stephen, it is now in full effect. We're introduced to one of those who are scattered in this chapter, Philip, who is known as the evangelist. So in, starting with verse 4, it goes on. Now those who were scattered went about preaching the word. Philip went down to the city of Samaria and proclaimed to them the Christ. And the crowds with one accord paid attention to what, he was, what was being said by Philip. And when they heard him and saw the signs that he did, for unclean spirits crying out with a loud voice came out of many who had them. And many who were paralyzed or lame were healed. So there was much joy in that city. And so we hear now one of the first ones, one of those who were scattered. We have Philip. Philip was another one of the deacons. In chapter 6, three weeks ago, we talked about uh, the choosing of the deacons, the choosing of the servants to help the church. Stephen was one. Philip was another. Philip was another one of these young, uh, godly men who were chosen to help lead the church. And now one of these deacons were sent out to Samaria. It's important to know when reading this, because I'm going to tell you, we're going to get a little bit later into this. I remember as a young believer reading this and being very confused at some of the theological implications later on in this, uh, in this chapter. But it's important to understand that Philip, this deacon, Philip the evangelist as he is known, is not Philip the apostle. Okay, so we need to understand that. We, we see Philip and a lot of times we interchange those, but this Philip is not Philip the apostle. So when the church scattered, he went to Samaria. For those of you uh, who are unsure about Samaria, let's just unpack that for a minute. Just for those of you who might look it up on the map, maybe if you go to the back of your Bible, you see uh, Samaria is actually north of Jerusalem. But it said that Philip went down to the city of Samaria. For one thing, Samaria is an area, but, and so we don't know exactly what city in Samaria, but when it says that it went down to Samaria, in the culture of the Jewish people, everything is down from Jerusalem, okay? When you're in Jerusalem, everything is down. That could be based upon the idea that Jerusalem's kind of on a hill, a city on a hill, or it could just be from their perspective, everything flows from Jerusalem. And so that's kind of, uh, that's kind of what's mentioned there when it says that it went down to the city of Jerusalem. 
uh, to the city of Samaria. Samaria was home to the Samaritans. Samaritans were a half-Jew, half-Gentile um, group of people. Uh, when Assyria um, captured Israel in 721 BC, many Jews stayed behind and many of them intermarried with the Assyrians. This caused a, a, a great divide between the Jews and the Samaritans, these people who were, uh, were, were in, in their culture called half-breeds. This culture, they, they were uh, very much, uh, uh, imagine the greatest divide between people groups, whether it is racism in, uh, in, in the South years ago, what, whatever it is, whatever that divide is, that is, that is the bitterness and the anger and the, and the vitriol between the Jews and the Samaritans. And so that's where Philip went to. Philip is called the evangelist. He apparently had this gift of evangelism. We'll see throughout the book of Acts that Philip just had the ability wherever he was to present the gospel. He had a hunger for showing people who Jesus was, especially people who were far from God, far from Jesus. And so he had this, this knack of doing that. Notice it says in verse, in verse 6, and the crowds with him, with one accord, paid attention to what, Philip, what was being said by Philip. This is before it talks about the, the the, the, the miracles. People were captivated by Philip. Philip had the ability to, to captivate, captivate crowds and they would listen with one accord. That's difficult. I mean, you guys, this, you're a captive audience and I still only have about 80% of, of your attention. And, and so Philip, in a community, in a town, was able to captivate these people and they were listening together with one accord. It says in verse 6, uh, in verse 8, I'm sorry, so that there was so much joy. So many of them were healed. There, there was so much joy in that city. The message of Jesus, the, the gospel of Jesus brought joy to that city. I love, I love that the writer of Acts, I love that he brings that, 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 that kind of just, just a little addition to the story there. That when he brought the gospel, there was so much joy in that city. And as I read this and I began to pray through the scripture, I began to ask, Lord, give us, Holy Spirit of God, give us a vision. Give us an idea. Give us the words. Give us the message. Give us the acts. Give us whatever it's going to take to bring joy to our city. Bring us. Uh, and may we as a church, as an individual Christian, as a people, be such, have such a hopeful, strong message that it brings joy to John's Island. One of those people that Philip met or uh, uh, was influenced was a magician, Simon the Magician, so we continue on in verse 9. But there was a man named Simon who had previously practiced magic in the city and amazed the people of Samaria, saying that he himself was somebody great. They all paid attention to him from the least to the greatest, saying this man is the power of God that is called great. And they paid attention to him because for a long time he had amazed them with his magic. But when they believed Philip, as he preached good news about the kingdom of God in the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized. The people of Samaria were baptized, both men and women. Even Simon himself believed, and after being baptized, he continued with Philip. And seeing signs and great miracles performed, he was amazed. So it's, a, it's an incredible story. You have, you have uh, Philip in Samaria. And he's reaching these people. And you have Simon the magician, Simon the sorcerer. And he had so much authority and so much, uh, um, he was so popular among the people. They would say, this man is the power of God. And he was called great. He was kind of pumped up. He was kind of a big deal, okay? Uh, and, and so when he was there, people were, were drawn to him. And now even Simon heard the gospel. People were uh, flocking and being converted and baptized and even Simon was converted Simon wasn't doing card tricks and pulling rabbits out of a hat by the way when we says that Simon the magician you're like 
oh, magic is horrible at Satan worship and that kind of stuff. I mean, I don't think when we're talking about what we might see today, I don't think, you know, going, ta-da, you know, pulling, you know, which, is this your card? I don't think that's what we're talking about here. I don't think we're talking about that kind of magician, what we might see on a cruise ship or whatever. What we're talking about is some, uh, w which was typical in ancient Jewish literature dealing with magic. Here's a couple of things that I think we're talking about here. Number one, di divination. The idea of obtaining an oracle, the uh, idea of being with someone who, uh, who would uh, give um, visions and, and uh, divine things that are um, kind of using the dark arts to find those things. An enchanter. Because of the similarity of this Hebrew word to the word for snake, some scholars are of the opinion that there is a connection to snake charming, that this guy was able to enchant, to uh, snake charm, to, to, to influence people that way. Uh, witchcraft, one who uses potions and spells. Exodus 7, 11 talks of, tells of a pharaoh that had a group among his court advisors. And then also a consulter of uh, familiar spirits, a variety of people like mediums and ghosts and spirits of the dead. All of these are used. In 1 Samuel 28, it describes a medium, a person who supposedly can make contact with the dead. So this is what we're talking about with Simon. We're not talking about a simple magician doing card tricks. We're talking about someone who is dealing with some pretty dark stuff as a magician. For Simon, magic brought him fame and no doubt fortune. He was important and literally called himself divine. For Simon, magic meant power. And power was the end and magic was the means to get there. The, the motivation for Simon was power. For the people, they were amazed by the show. And magic for them was the end. For the people, they just wanted the show. They were amazed at what Simon could do. So Simon was after the power. The people were just after the show. And as I began to think through this and process through this interesting connection, it's very similar to how we can get trapped in church cultures where we're after the show, where, where we're after people who are able to put on a, a good show and do amazing things. And we get, we are so susceptible to the cult of personality that we don't even recognize that the personality is, their motivation is power, and we're just giving that to them, ceding that to them, because our motivation is just wanting to be part of the show. But Philip, Philip comes into the picture and he kind of wrecks it because the signs were not the end. He was able to, through the Holy Spirit, heal the lame, to call out evil spirits. He was able to heal. He was able to do miracles. But the signs were not the end. They were the beginning. You see, the gospel comes in and wrecks that whole process, that whole dynamic between Simon, uh, between Simon and the people. The gospel was the end. You see, the gospel represented a full life. It represented hope. It represented eternal life. The gospel was the end. The signs were the beginning. However, it says that Simon believed and he was baptized and followed Philip. We don't know about his motives at this point. We don't know if it was a real conversion at this point. We just know that he believed with everyone else. We know that he was baptized and we know that he chose to follow Philip. And so that takes us to the next part of the situation. Simon and Peter. Peter gets involved. Starting in verse 14. And now when the apostles at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent to them Peter and John, who came down and prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit, for he had not yet fallen on any of them. But they, laid, but they had only been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And so they laid hands on them and they received the Holy Spirit. Now when Simon saw that the Spirit was given through the laying on of apostles' hands, he offered them money saying, Give me this power also so that anyone on whom I lay my hands may receive the Holy Spirit. But Peter said to him, May your silver perish with you because you thought you could obtain the gift of God with money. You have neither part nor lot in this matter, for your heart is not right before God. Repent, therefore, of this wickedness of yours, and pray to the Lord 
If possible, the intent of your heart may be forgiven for you. For I see that you are in gall of bitterness and in the bond of iniquity. And Simon answered, pray for me to the Lord, that nothing of what you said may come upon me. And when they had testified and spoken the word of the Lord, they returned to Jerusalem, preaching the gospel to many villages of the Samaritans. So you have Peter and John coming into this situation. And so they're hearing about what Philip's doing. Philip's doing a great job. Again, this is this young man, this young deacon. He went out, he is scattered. He goes to Samaria of all places. He's preaching the gospel. People are getting saved. And they're like, whoa. And so word gets up to the home church that this missionary down, uh, down uh, up in Samaria is doing this amazing thing. And so Peter and John's like, okay, we got to find out about this. This is significant. And so they go, they travel to Samaria to find out what's what. And it says they go and they, uh, they, they lay hands on people to receive the Holy Spirit because up to this point, they had only been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, I was confused at this because this, is some, this can be confusing. It's like, whoa, whoa, whoa. I thought, Pastor, you told me that once I surrender my life to Jesus, I receive the Holy Spirit, that you receive the Holy Spirit once you give your heart to Jesus. You surrender your heart to Jesus. Now why, oh why, did this come later? Why was this a second prayer that required the Holy Spirit? Well, I'm going to tell you why. It's important to understand that Acts of the Apostles, this book of Acts, is a historical book. This is a description of events used to, by God to establish the very early church as it spread to people, not only to devout Jews, but people outside the Jewish community. This is profound. Guys, you need to understand that this idea of a faith that had once been ground in Jewish culture now was opening up outside the Jewish culture. This was a big deal. And so it's important that not only is it recorded, but it's important for that, that this had to happen this way. And we'll, we'll, we'll dive into that a little bit more. The Holy Spirit waiting for Peter and John is no more the norm today than the Holy Spirit waiting for the day of Pentecost. You see, why did the Lord, why did the Holy Spirit wait till the day of Pentecost for them to receive the Holy Spirit in the upper room? Well, that had to do with all kinds of, you know, historical and theological issues. But it doesn't mean that once you believe in Jesus, you have to wait 20 days, 40 days, and at that day, the Holy Spirit falls. No. And there is a reason. Just because, just because that happened in the, 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 the first day of Pentecost doesn't mean that it's going to happen that way forevermore. There's, there is a history. God is working by by, by establishing his early church, God is working by lining these things up on purpose in a way. Peter and John don't come because the Holy Spirit needs them to come. We need to understand that right away. It's not like the Holy Spirit is like, oh, thank God you guys are here because Philip couldn't do this. It, no, the Holy Spirit doesn't need Peter and John, but they needed them the, the, the church, the history of the church needed them to validate the new Samaritan church. Think of it as First Baptist Samaria, okay? I mean, that, that, and so the, this missionary, this church planner came in, Philip, and it's like, wow, some stuff's going on. And so they had to get some guys over here to make sure that everything was on the up and up. So there's two reasons why this was important. First, it's important to understand that the Samaritans for them to have an absolute certainty that they are joining the established church that worships Jesus of Nazareth, this Jesus that they've heard stories about, this Jesus the Messiah. Philip is a great man, but he's just a deacon. He's a young kid, not an elder of the church in Jerusalem as the apostles are. Peter and John are known to be the two of Jesus' original followers. They give credibility. Peter and John, they know about these guys. They've heard of these guys. These two guys, they're, 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 they're the OGs. They're, they're from the very beginning. They're with Jesus. And so they bring credibility. And it's important 
that credibility is established in this area in, uh, specifically. And that takes us to our second reason. The church in Jerusalem needs to validate that the Holy Spirit really can come to the Samaritans. This validation is especially important for Peter. As he continues, Peter continues to have trouble understanding how people who are not Jewish can be accepted into what he sees as the ultimate fulfillment of Judaism. We're going to see this more in chapter 10. Guys, this is bold. This is dynamic. This idea that the Holy Spirit has now fallen and a Christian church is now established in Samaria. Profound. I mean, incredibly profound. I mean, took down this tears down all the racial barriers, tears down all the prejudice, tears it all down. Now the gospel of Jesus Christ is able to fuse these two group people groups that hated each other, despised each other, and it had to happen. Jesus, the Holy Spirit, had to establish a church early on in Samaria to let it be a message to everyone. Because if the, if, the, if the Christian church can be established in Samaria, it can be established in anywhere. That was a big deal. It was a big deal. It had to happen. And so why? Why did Peter and John have to come? Because this couldn't just be some, some, some side move of the Holy Spirit, some side move of the Christian church. This had, Samaria had to happen. It had to be central to the story. So what can we glean from this passage today? We have two lessons from Philip that I want to give you and two lessons from Simon. Really quickly, two lessons from Philip. Number one, he wasn't held back by conflict. Philip was a fellow deacon with Stephen. You have to assume they were close. You have to assume that these guys were friends, and yet he saw his friend die. All of a sudden, this idea of Christianity, it got real real quick. I mean, still us, I mean, even, even today, and we live in this culture today where Christianity, we're, we're definitely in a post-Christian society where you can get mocked and you can lose your job and there's all kinds of things that can happen for you if you proclaim Jesus as Lord. But still, even today, in today's society, you don't have to really worry about losing your life if you proclaim Jesus as Lord. I wonder what it would do to the church attendance if all of a sudden persecution got to that level. And so it's understandable that one of your friends dies simply because he's proclaiming the gospel and Stephen does not, I mean, Philip does not shrink back. He instead moves forward. There's an awesome uh, evangelist that I think he's still around doing his thing, but he was really popular. Uh, in, in the 90s. His name was Adrian Dupre, and he was a chaplain for the Carolina Gamecocks, and Lord knows they needed prayer. And so um, they, um, uh, all right, sorry, um, but um, he, he came and he did a, a youth rally for me one time, and he told this incredible story, and I'll never forget it, that he had a friend, um, he had a friend who was just newly married, and the wife died in a car accident. I mean, we're talking like weeks they were married. And he's praying with his friend, and he's hurting, and he's crying, and he's like, I'm going to go tell three people about Jesus right now. And the guy was like, what? He's like, that's the only thing I can do when I'm hurting. The only thing I can do is kick Satan in the teeth. And the best way to kick Satan in the teeth is to tell people about Jesus. Well, that was Philip's idea. Philip was an evangelist. And Stephen, his friend, was just killed, just murdered for the gospel. And so Philip's reaction is to be bold. Philip's reaction is not to be held back, but say, I'm going to go to the hardest place. I'm not going to go anywhere. I'm not going to go to a suburb of Jerusalem. I'm going to Samaria. I'm going to the place that we all hate. And I'm going to tell them all about Jesus. Philip not only was willing to, to continue the gospel, he wasn't held back by conflict. He went head on into it. 
The second thing we learn about Philip is that he wasn't held back by different. Some people are afraid to engage different types of people. And different these days can be different. It's difficult sometimes, man. It's difficult when you see people that are quote-unquote different, and that can mean anything. Whatever came to your mind when I just said different, that's what I'm talking about. Because different means everything, different, to, different is different for every one of you. But whatever different means for you, it's difficult to minister, to, sh to share the gospel with different. But we have to understand, we have to get to this place that everyone, everyone is created by God. Red and yellow, black and white, rainbow, whatever, they're all precious in his sight. The same Jesus that died for you died for them and they need the gospel. Philip wasn't held back by conflict and he wasn't held back by different. I also want to look at a couple of lessons from this different character, Simon. Simon the magician. One of the lessons we see from the life of Simon is we need to understand that we don't, we should not see the gospel as something that's going to benefit you. We should not see the gospel as something that is going to benefit you. This is a common problem. I am saved so that I can get something. I'm saved so that I can go to heaven. I'm saved so that I can get blessed. I'm saved because the guy on TV told me that if I'm saved, if I get my life to Jesus, then all my debt will go away. I'm saved so that I can be healed of this disease. I'm saved because dot, 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 whatever it is. That is a common problem. We don't, we should never see the gospel as something that will benefit us. The gospel is about our reconciling our life to Jesus, not inviting Jesus into my life. You see, we've gotten this backwards. The American church has completely reversed this. It's not about inviting Jesus into my life. Lord, come into my life and make my life better. Come into my life and make my life the full experience that it needs to be. No, that's the opposite. It's us surrendering our life to Jesus. It's, Lord, I give up my life. I surrender my life. I have no more authority over my life. I give it to you, Jesus. That's the gospel. Simon saw that the gospel was God and he needed it. He was, however, still holding on to that grifter lifestyle. And guys, when you surrender your life to Jesus, you are 100% reconciled to God. Absolutely. That doesn't mean that all of your lifestyle, all of your behaviors, everything in you suddenly goes away and you're completely holy. Doesn't work like that. Man, it's so... You, Simon, he lived in his entire life kind of grifting and seeking power using his quote-unquote gifts. It takes a while to let go of that habit. It takes a while to let go of that lifestyle. And so I think that he saw that the gospel was good, but I also think it was difficult for him to let go of that grifter. And so when he saw Peter and John lay hands and saw people in power with the Holy Spirit, his instinct was, <laughs> i got to get me some of that. And so we went to Peter, how much that, what can, what can I give you? I want that. His instinct was to go back into his lifestyle. Many preachers harp on the fact that Simon tried to buy the Holy Spirit, and they talk about, uh, you know, they spend a lot of time on that part of the message on trying to buy the Holy Spirit and how we can, you know, how we try to influence God. We try to, to think we can just kind of get in under the radar or whatever. We see that life. I think there's a lot of Simon in all of us. 
I think if we were to be real, if we were to examine our hearts, I think there's a lot of Simon in all of us. I think we honestly want to follow Jesus, but I think that so many times we still dip into our old life. Our, 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 our instinct has yet to be completely changed, and we dip into our old life. We just need help letting go of our old lifestyle and that leads to the second lesson from the life of simon don't be afraid of rebuke don't be afraid of rebuke now peter if you study scripture and we went all the way through the book of luke and now we're going through the book of acts and so you learn that peter peter was not shy you know, he, he had the, the he, he was bold. Even when he shouldn't be bold, he was bold. And so Peter's not going to be like, all right, dude, that's not cool. That's not Peter's style. He's going to go, how dare you? You are going to be buried with your silver. And he just went after him. That's Peter's style. And when Peter rebuked him, Simon didn't get angry. Simon didn't go bring his magic potions out and say, oh, you messed with the wrong guy. He didn't go after him. He didn't say, you're not allowed to judge me. Don't you judge me. You know, he didn't go there. Simon didn't go there at all. I'm yelling too much today. Instead, as Peter rebuked him and said, listen, you're still full of anger. You're still full of sin. You're still holding on to your old life. And I'm telling you, God's not going to have any part of it. And what did Simon do? He didn't lose his temper. He didn't do his abracadabra on Paul. He, I mean, on Peter. He didn't do any of that. He said, please, pray for me. I, I, pray for me. I don't want any of that to happen. Pray for I, I My bad. All Christians should seek out discipleship. All Christians should seek out discipleship. What is discipleship? That's one person, one believer walking another believer to Jesus. And sometimes, sometimes that discipleship includes rebuke. If you're in a relationship with someone, you're in a huddle with someone, you're being discipled by someone, and they have never rebuked you, they have never said, listen, that is not cool. What you're doing there is not godly and you need to walk away from that. If you, they have never done that, find you another discipler. Lord knows I've needed people rebuking me in my life. I had an accountability partner, a guy that I love dearly. Still to this day, I love him. He was just a horrible accountability partner. And I would meet with him and I would, I would confess to doing something. He'd say, you know, we've all been there. It's all right. No! I need you to yell at me. You're older than me. You're supposed to say, hey, don't be a dummy. Or whatever. However you want to say it. We, we need to, sometimes we need to be rebuked. We need to receive rebuke. And we need to grow from rebuke. Simon heard the rebuke and he didn't, he didn't attack it. Instead, he said, pray for me. People see Simon as this horrible figure in the Bible. I see Simon as, a, as an example of what discipleship looks like. If we, we follow Jesus, we get excited, and then we, we, we try to hold on to our old lifestyle, and yet someone who is above us is able to uh, rebuke us and correct us. And then he says, no, pray for me that I might be made right. It's amazing this... This quote-unquote bad guy gives us a beautiful picture of what discipleship is. So how do we respond to this word today? I mean, it's amazing to see. I, I, it's amazing to see the Holy Spirit working as this church begins to grow. What it shows us is even in the, even in the face of conflict, even in the face of bad times, even in the face of of struggles, God's word, God's power will not be bound. And so I want to lead us in some prayer today. So if you'll just bow your heads and close your eyes, I just want to take some time just to 
soak in God's word and to pray. I want you to pray, Lord, give me the courage to take the gospel to people that are different than myself. Did the Holy Spirit just give you a picture of who that was? If he did, that's who. Take a moment and pray for God to give you the courage to surrender to Jesus because of who he is and not what he can do for you. Take this moment to love Jesus because he is Lord. We love you, Jesus. Holy Spirit of God, continue to work in our life. Give us boldness to reach out to those people who are different give us the words to say forgive us when we're our faith is all about us and what you can do for us instead of simply surrendering to you because you are god and that is the beginning and the end of it lord you jesus are god and worthy of our worship Continue to move in us as an individual. Continue to move in us as a church. That we may, through your Holy Spirit, bring joy to this city. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. As we continue to respond to the word, there are going to be people in the back welcome table to pray for you. If you just need, maybe you have some, some needs specifically for prayer, maybe... Maybe a time, maybe you have prayer for healing. Maybe you need prayer for physical, spiritual, emotional healing. They're there for you to, to just pray for you, just to receive you. Of course, every week we respond to the Lord. We respond to the gospel by remembering what Jesus did at the table. We take the bread that represents the body of Christ. We take the juice that represents the blood of Jesus, and we remember what he did on the cross that allowed us to be reconciled to him. I say this again, this is open communion. You don't have to be a member of our church. We do ask that this be, this is a sacred moment, a sacred time. And so if you are not a believer of Jesus, if you wouldn't, if you wouldn't mind just hanging back and respecting this process, knowing that we are so glad that you're here. Let us pray as we respond to the Lord. God, you are so good, even when times are not good. You're good because you're there. You're good because you're God. And we worship you because you are God. We thank you for what you did on the cross that allowed us to be reconciled with you. Despite our sin, despite our history, despite our past, we have access to you through the cross. And we remember that. Lord, examine our hearts. That if there is anything that is not of you in our hearts, that we may be willing to pray and be forgiven and walk out free. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.